And welcome everybody to the Daily Space Weather Show. We'll be shortening things a little bit tonight because hopefully we'll be out looking for the Aurora once again, as many of you may have been doing. So we have found ways to show you the solar wind information and so on. So let's get right down to it again. This will be a slightly shortened video tonight. There's another CME headed this way that launched this morning. That should be arriving sometime on the 13th, possibly even late in the day on the 12th. Wealth, but probably something like early in the day on the 13th, another coronal mass ejection. It came from this area right down in here. So we won't spend a whole lot of time monkeying around with that. By the way, I'm your host, Dan, a.k.a. Smash o Mash, and thanks for tuning into the Smash News Network, least busted name and news. If you enjoy the content, don't forget to press the like button, press share, leave a comment, etc. Tell your friends and foes about the channel. It is, after all, the world's most comprehensive daily space weather content. If you're new, press subscribe. Otherwise, how would you get the world's most comprehensive daily space weather content delivered directly to your YouTube subscription feed? Also, visit the links below the video in the description and help support the channel as we would prefer to keep it in existence. So yeah, the geoelectric field is seeing lots of spikes over the past 24 hours. It's been an exciting time for space weather. The geoelectric field map is one of the ways you can view what's going on as far as power grid induction if you're in US and Canada. Just check out the Space Weather Prediction Center. It is the geoelectric field map US and Canada one-dimensional model. The empirical data. We'll briefly look at volcanoes and earthquakes here, although we're not too concerned about that. Ibu is exploding. You've got a 20,000 foot ash plume there over Ibu. That's a significant thing. Please do not pole vault the caldera at Ibu. Also, Luatobi exploding. Semeru, Dakono, Sancho Guido, Fuego, Nevado de Ruiz, Reventador, and Sabancaya. 28,000 foot ash plume there over Sabancaya. It's a flight level 280. As far as quakes, Seismic activity is low. Let's talk about the quakes of a five and greater magnitude over the past 24 hours, like this 5.0 at Hiru, Japan. Yeah, that was at zero dark 47 this morning. That 5.0 magnitude quake. Besides that, not a lot shaken at all. And just a 5.0 in Tonga. And a 5.1 in Azerbaijan. Yes, Azure, Azerbaijan. Also, Vanuatu had a 5.2. Let's get back to space weather. I don't know what this radio flux is. It's down a little bit today to 214, but we're going to see an uptick in the sunspot number by tomorrow. So if you're new to the radio flux, it's uh, a directly proportional data set to sunspot number. We'll show you. But there's the one-year graph of the radio flux depicted by this lovely black line. The red line right here is the sunspot number. And here, check it out. You can see how proportional the radio flux and sunspot number are. So there's the 10.7 centimeter radio flux. There is the sunspot number. They are directly proportional data sets. And by the way, the space weather will continue. Not just proton events as forecasted, but major geomagnetic storm activity likely to continue. So yeah, look at that. KP7 there on the forecast by NOAA multiple times over the next three days. It will continue into Monday. So if you don't get a chance to see the Aurora tonight into Sunday morning, Sunday night into Monday morning might afford you a time to do so. So yeah. And if you think you see the Aurora, don't forget to get out your camera and try to take video time lapse, of course. And you know, a tripod and time lapse is pro. That's how you, you know, that's the best way to view the Aurora time lapse on a tripod. So you know, the, the aurora is primarily ultraviolet light, which means most of it can't be seen by the human eye. So if you think you see it, your camera might really be picking up some stuff. So yeah, another CME on the way. It'll be a more minor impact, this one likely to arrive. It looks like Noah agrees that, well, it looks like Noah's expecting that one to show up sometime midday on the 12th there. So, But again, it's a glancing blow. It's even west of stereo A. Let's see what ESA has to say about it. There's ESA's Enlil Spiral. And shout out to Eugene the Philosopher. If you haven't subscribed to his channel, we found the solar wind data that he was asking for. You may have noticed that it's not available on the NOAA sites, but we found some for you anyway. Now, the GOES magnetometer is still showing some fluctuations, as you would expect with incoming space weather. Unfortunately, if you bring up the ACE real-time solar wind or the, the main real-time solar wind that we show all the time, 
you won't be getting any results. So we have pulled up some information from the Integrated Space Weather Analysis Center for you instead. And as you can see here, the solar wind speed is currently in the high 800s, low 900s range. So that's the ACE and the Discover. The ACE is up top. The solar wind velocity there is over on the on the right side. The solar wind density is over here on the left side. So, you know, we saw some big density spikes there. Solar wind density there getting up over 150 kilometers. Um, I mean, over 150 protons per cubic centimeter there for a brief period of time. But again, the big story now is the solar wind speed, which is pushing 900 kilometers per second. We'll also show you the KP index as that site's down as well on Space Weather Prediction Center. So KP index here is now dropping, and it has to do with the magnetic fields not being all that appropriate to conduct a lot, uh, to uh, induce a lot of current into the earthly system. So here is the BTBZ timeline. And yeah, as you can see there, uh, the top is the the top is the total field so you can see it's all the way down to like like something like 11 or 12 nanotesla and it has a bz that's the vertical component of the magnetic field northward oriented there of something like positive 11 so that's not conducive to geomagnetic storm conditions Although, again, like I said, we do have this highly elevated solar wind velocity. So that's the KP index stuff. There you go. There's the solar wind density and velocity over the past three days from both the ACE and the Discover. Again, that's the BTBZ. And the magnetic field is weakened. However, there are multiple additional CME impacts. And it's getting very tough to figure out when they're arriving as they've been cannibalizing each other. Anyway, there's the point. For the Aurora forecast, tonight's Aurora forecast and tomorrow's Aurora forecast are pretty spectacular. So it looks like tomorrow's going to be a little bit weaker, but it looks like Sunday night into Monday might be pretty good. So, yeah, it's uh, Saturday night into Sunday, Sunday night into Monday, and then extended into Monday. So even you West Coasters, you might be able to catch some Aurora on Monday morning if you're up early enough. And check it out, we've also got, there we are, the data from two ground-based magnetometers there. Also, in addition to Boulder, we've also got Karuna and Tormestorp. So you can see some wild fluctuations there in those ground magnetometers. It is also split to show you the KP, and we had extended periods of KP9, KP9 plus at that Tormestorp location at 56 degrees north latitude. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's some pretty serious geomagnetic storming. The strongest we've seen since over 20 years ago. So 2003, was it? The Halloween storms, as they're called. Now, if you want to check out some auroral shares, we do have some over on Twitter. Of course, there are some from Minsk, Belarus. And there is more over there as well, but we would encourage you to view us over on Twitter. Here's one of our viewers here. Shout out to Carrie. Thanks for sending that to us. She's located west of San Francisco there in California. So some fantastic aurora. Next Earth Magnetic Moment from space for the past four hours. And again, things are a little calmer here, but we do have a very high speed solar wind pushing 900 kilometers per second. Some of the fastest we've seen in the solar cycle 25. So there is a high pressure environment out there for sure. And we're running extremely late today. We apologize if the premiere was a little bit later than 7 p.m. We tried to get it out as early as we could. I think we may have had to set this one up as an instant premiere, but we'll get it onto your screens as promptly as we can. Here's Earth's magnetic moment from the ground level. And uh, yeah, there's still a high likelihood of seeing the aurora, depending on where you're located. But we had some very far south uh, auroral viewing last night. Again, one of the ways you could figure out how to view the aurora would be by using the geoelectric field grid map, the geoelectric field map for US and Canada. That's a fantastic way to find things out. And check it out. Okay, sweet. The KP index data is now back. So there you go. Extended periods of KP9 and KP8. Anyway, we've shown you some forecasts. Again, 
two more nights. So that's three in a row we're going to have. It's like a space weather wave, almost like a heat wave, but with space weather. Again, as far as the real-time solar wind data that we usually show, those are out. Goes magnetometer data are up, though. So that's not too bad. The goes 16 and goes 18 there, showing us the magnetic field in the outer portion of the outer Van Allen belts. They orbit at about 23,500 miles of altitude. Next to heliosphere, and Earth has indeed snapped into a south pole magnetic sector as we forecasted yesterday. It's not a big deal, but sector boundary crossings do matter with some matters of space weather, so we cover it. There you go, south pole magnetic sector. Welcome to the south pole magnetic sector, all of you Earthlings out there. Next is our line of sight field plot as we have south pole oriented coronal holes rotating in here from the east, and that brings us to coronal holes. Here is our line of sight coronal hole field plot. Again, south pole coronal holes here rotating in. They'll become more well-defined in the next couple of days. And how about a quick view of coronal holes from the perspective of SDO? Now, you will see that CME popping off as well. You may see some limb darkening as that CME originated from very far to the west. However, some of the ejecta kind of moved to the northeast, which would be toward Earth from the perspective of that sunspot. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what's going on. Additional CME headed this way as if we didn't have enough. And yes, I have 100% lost count. Let's get to sunspots. Sunspot number here is now back down to uh, about 163. 163, we'll say it is. And uh, that's going to be changing. It's going to be changing because before sunspot 3664, which is the one that's been responsible for all those major flare sets, before it sets, we'll see an uptick in sunspot number on tomorrow's video. That is because a bunch of new sunspots have formed. So before we show footage of that, here's our flare probability monitor and scoreboard. And look at the likelihood of an X-class solar flare from sunspot 3664. It is at least 65% for an X flare and at least 60% for an M flare. So that's uh, pretty good chances to see some more fireworks. And as we say all the time on the channel, it's more likely to see a large solar flare at that limb, and it's more likely to see a major proton event. As we already got a major proton event, it's likely for it to get even more major as a result. So, sunspots are next. Here they are from SDO. That ain't half bad. That's our SDO HMI Instruments magnetogram of the photosphere. Sunspot 3664 has not degraded in terms of its magnetic fields. So it remains very likely to produce large solar flares, not just as a result of its magnetic field, magnetic fields, I should say, not only as a result of that, but also its proximity to the limb. Also, we do have some growth and new sunspots rising there in the east. So again, that will be an uptick in sunspot number going into tomorrow, most likely if trends continue the way they have, we'll have a bunch of new sunspots counted before sunspot 3664 sets right over here. Yowzers. Yowzers. Space weather is bonkers, folks. Bonkers. Of course, you may see some technical difficulty in space weather websites. It's partially because <coughs> it's partially because there are a, th a trillion noobs trying to view the sites. And uh, yeah, technical difficulties. Those are a thing. <laughs> anyway, the ghost proton flux here, it is, you can see quite a big spike in it this morning. Yeah. So yeah, major proton event. There it is. We have the high energy protons here, the greater than 50 and greater than or equal to 100 mega electron volt proton flux here all coming up off the floor. The highest 
Uh, energy there not quite reaching into warning levels, but major radio blackouts as a result. So there you can see, uh, also as forecasted, major radio blackouts from proton events. Again, the likelihood of that increasing and seeing more significant polar radio blackouts in the coming days or longer lasting ones uh, is, is really going up as Sunspot 3664 sets in that western limb. So yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of stuff going on at the same time. Our X-ray flux, there it is over the past 24 hours, and the largest solar flare of the cycle occurred just this morning. It was a nearly an X6 class flare. We'll say five, I think it was 5.89 was peak flux. 5.85 at least. So there you go. And that was uh, quite early this morning. And we did have a video in 131 angstroms. We need to show that flare. Look, it's a real cool time to be talking about space weather, uh, but it's a real bad time to be accessing data because a million noobs who've never heard of it before are now all over the internet that are they're downloading every possible thing about it. Everybody has to be an expert on everything as it happens and chase every possible fad. So uh, we're not showing you the flare. We're not showing you the flare because I can't get it on screen. And frankly, I've got to rest up because I may have to be out for many hours in the night taking video and footage photographs of the Aurora. So here's our solar system forecast before we're old and gray and I wait and wait and wait and wait for little bits of data to show up. There's where things will be in a week in the solar system. Here's what's going on over Head Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, and I'm getting overheated and getting sweaty and angry. So there goes that. And uh, yeah, what's next? I don't know. The astronomy photo of the day talking about sunspot 3664 as seen from Rome. And there's always some interesting, well, there's often some interesting links to see there in the apod.nasa.gov astronomy picture of the day. One of them is a link to an auroral gallery. So spaceweather.com is always good to see those. And let's get on to CMEs as there was another partial halo, including an earthly directed component just this morning. You'll see it very early in the video there. That's 80 frames from today. And there it goes. Or should I say here it comes? Or you could say both. So here's the CME propagating at 212 from the Lasco C2. Here it goes, or here it comes. And we'll also show it on the C3. We'll let that play through. So there you have it, another CME on the way. <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah, you know, almost like in 2020 when everybody became a virologist, now you know, everybody's going to become a space weather expert five seconds into space weather events. That'll be fun. We won't have anybody conflating coronal mass ejections with solar flares or anything. No, no, that couldn't happen. Everybody understands that solar flares and coronal mass ejections are separate phenomena, right? Right? <laughs> of course they do. <laughs> Anyway, there's where Stereo A is located. Here's Stereo A and its different symmetry. You can see this CME is slightly off to the west of Stereo A as well. Most of the most of the plasma will miss to the west. However, like I said, there is an earthly directed component because a bunch of that plasma moved up to its northeast as it dissipated. So we'll play those through as well for your viewing pleasure. So there were some additional CMEs. They're not earthly directed. And frankly, we've got to, you know, limit what we're covering here because you have to have priorities and priorities have to be actual geo effective stuff, which brings us to our custom coronagraphs, custom coronagraphs. They're pretty sweet. And here at the Smash News Network, these busted name of news, we're pretty sweet on showing you pretty sweet footage. So there you go. And look at all that snow. That's solar energetic particles striking the aperture on the SOHO spacecraft. You've also got Jupiter moving into frame there on your left. That's a lot of stuff going on. And one of those CMEs, really the first major one that you see, is another event containing Earth-directed components. 
Yowzers. And by the way, we are showing you that X-Class flare from this morning as well. It is on there. Here you'll see it, and we've added 100, 193 angstroms there to the 304 angstroms SDO imagery. And there's an even closer view for you. So that's another 24-hour video there, 30 frames per second. And that is where our custom videos end and our bonus segments begin. Bonus features start with filaments. So filaments can turn into coronal mass ejections, and often we <coughs> see them on the surface of the sun long before they eject. Now, sometimes they just spontaneously come out of an active region, uh, but often we see filaments ejecting with no, no warning. You know, there's no solar flare often associated with a filament eruption. Sometimes they just blast off on their own, like that one in the upper left does. So it, it was there, and whoops, now it's gone. That was that one that we saw in the northeast on the coronagraphs this morning. Also, you can see the Charles Barkley filament there in the lower right is in the process of becoming a coronal mass ejection as we make the video. Now, that one's very unlikely to be earthly directed. Although CMEs can come from the far side, from an, of low, from an active region that's not even visible, and still end up striking Earth. So there's the Charles Barkley filament, uh, the tail end of its ejection. Most of it has ejected. Only a little bit is raining back down there. A little bit of plasma rain there happening on the closest star. And there's the full disk view from the GO-16 SUVI depicting ionized helium. 304 angstroms. It's for the past about two hours, and here come bonus features. Charging hazards, we do have some surface charging there over Central Asia, I'll say. Central Asia seeing some surface charging. The GO's electron flux here coming up off the floor, so that's kind of surprising. Um, looks like Noah's forecast was right, and I was wrong. It does happen occasionally. I like to admit it because it tends to create things like learning and progress. So, yeah, there's, uh, there's the past year of the relativistic electrons. There's Noah's forecast. Noah's expecting a big uptick in the electron flux here. So that is at the F layer of the ionosphere, which we're going to show next. And golly gee, the ionosphere is extremely... It's, it's ringing like a bell, as they say on spaceweather.com. And there it is, and it's extremely anomalous in the ionosphere right now. So that's about 300 kilometers of altitude. That's the approximate altitude of the F layer. And you'll see both a shocking amount of high frequency and low frequency anomalies there. So highly anomalous. And if that's all Greek to you, don't worry will show the anomaly gram. Look at the high frequency anomalies. Major high frequency anomalies there. So, but you'll see a mix here. You'll see both low and high frequency anomalies. So huge variations there happening in the Earth's ionosphere. A, a banner weekend, really. It is the, I think we should call this solar storm, we should call this one the Mother's Day solar storm, as suggested by Dr. Scott McIntosh over on Twitter. Yet another reason to follow us. We retweet his tweets occasionally. Also, we've got massive GPS errors likely. There's our total electron content on the left in the anomaly gram. Also, maximum usable radio frequency. Of course, like I said earlier, we've got huge polar radio blackouts, and it looks like we have some issues with the actual data itself here or the spacecraft that are doing the data measurements or the communication. Check it out. We're getting a whiteout there at the end. Watch the Global Ionosphere Nowcast. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> that's suboptimal. So sometimes space weather can affect our ability to observe space weather. Look at the last couple of hours. We have no idea what the total electron contents are. That's bonkers. Anyway, we'll try to show you the latest intensity gram and latest magnetogram, but it's probably not going to load. Let's see. It's trying to load. Is it actually going to load? I have no idea, and I don't have time to wait because I've got to, like, I've got to chill. I've got to chill, folks, because, you know, major aurora might be visible way down in Pennsylvania once again tonight. Let's look at meteorology briefly. Here's the Earth's lowest pressure about 948 hectopascals in the southern ocean that seems like 
an inhospitable place to be as winter approaches for the South Pole. Anyway, these are the surface winds and jet streams of planet Earth. Shout out to our viewers in the east. Here are your jet streams. Shout out to our viewers from the central world. There are your jet streams. Here are your surface winds. Shout out to our viewers from the west. Surface winds are here. There is a low off the coast of the U.S. as well as one uh, north of Lake Erie. A crappy, weak Canadian low, which sucks and is messing up our weather again. There are the jet streams for the Western world. And here's our satellite map. And let's start complaining about Canada. Canada. It sends us cold air all the time. However, sometimes it's the sight of a crappy, lousy, stupid, weak low that just loiters north of Lake Erie and sends clouds over Pennsylvania on a night when you can see the aurora. Here's a close-up of this stupid, crappy, loitering low. It's just north of Tiverton. It's north of Tiverton, or is it Tiverton? I don't know, but there it is. That's the center of this weak low. It's so weak, it's 1,002 hectopascals. Not very low is that pressure, but as you can see, there's a counterclockwise rotation, and it's associated with cold air. Cold air. The air is not as cold as my soul, and it won't be as cold as your soul if you fail to press the like button. Hopefully your soul won't be cast into the river Styx because you've failed to press the like button. Don't be a fool. Here's a satellite imagery for the U.S. Here is the weather.gov site. We'll scroll down and show you the thing. There's some frost advisories there in New England and some floods and stuff. If your location's lit, weather.gov is where you can find out whether or not you've got weather coming. Here comes some forecast GFS 72 hour pressure and precipitation and there's some extremely strong weather making its way, starting out in Louisiana and making its way across the Gulf Coast in the coming days. So look at that, those are some tornadic type supercell producing storms. There, there it is. Starting in Louisiana and Texas and sweeping across the Gulf states, it could produce damaging wind, hail, tornadoes, etc for all of your disaster erotica. All of your disaster erotica, folks. Temperature anomaly forecast degrees Celsius, 72 hour GFS model. It's the only other thing we're showing because I'm getting, I'm getting fatigued. I've done a lot of things and I've got to do a lot more. So here's our lightning map. That's the past like 10 hours. That's what's been going on. Here's what is going on. And look at that. Nobody's looking at lightningmaps.org. It's got lots of bandwidth available because everybody is becoming an expert in space weather and chasing a, chasing the current thing and, and, of course, reporting in all kinds of crazy, crazy ways. But, yeah, there we go. We've got some lightning there in central Texas. What do you got? What do you got? What do you got? De Leon. De Leon. Or is it De Leon? De Leon. I don't I don't know. I, I definitely don't care. So let's move on. US Doppler radar. We've got a strong system there south of Alaska. Here's what's going on in the lower 48 where we'll focus. Here's your satellite. Note that crappy low that's just east of Michigan there. Shout out to all of our Michiganders. And that low is moving and we'll have variable skies over Pennsylvania all night thanks to that crappy weather system. Here's your recap U.S. Doppler radar at the picked vertical motion of the air column. Ground-based systems. Here is our space-based visible satellite. Ah, how sweet it is. And here is our water vapor map and here is me signing off and getting this video onto your screens. So thanks for tuning in. I've been your host, Dan, a.k.a. smash o -Mash, signing off. And may that solar wind be at your back. I'm going back to the bunker. Whoa!